everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 83 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about the perks of being a wallflower on your If You Fail Me, You Get Me Next Semester podcast. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. And this week, I am so excited to tell you that we are joined by extra special guest Julia Morizawa. Julia is a writer, actress, and producer. She had recurring roles on two Star Trek web series, Odyssey and Hidden Frontier, and is most Ooh. recently <laughs> and is most recently well known for her role as Dr. Joan Bright on the Bright Sessions podcast. Julia, thank you so much for coming to talk on the show, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad I'm here, too. Thank you for having me. I'm especially excited because I know when you initially reached out to me, you had asked me for a a list of my favorite movies, Mm -hmm. and you had made a couple of suggestions based off that list, and then I looked at your long list of things that you were still needing to read and or watch, Mm -hmm. and I saw... I saw The Perks of Being a Wallflower on there, and I was like, uh, excuse me, excuse me, hello. <laughs> yes, I, w- I would like to do that one. So I'm really excited. This is definitely one of the most like influential pieces of, of art or works in my life. So okay. I have a lot to say about it. Oh, that's fantastic. Do you want to go ahead and, and tell us kind of why it's so influential to you, like how you experienced this uh, earlier in your life? Yeah, so uh, I think I discovered the book... Boy, it must have been in high school for me, um, not to age myself, but eh, too late. So, um, no, I I actually don't remember if somebody introduced me to it. I want to say a friend of mine from high school introduced me to it, but it was one of those books that I always like to say, in a lot of ways, actually saved my life because as a, a teenager, as an adolescent, I believed that I was struggling with undiagnosed depression, but I didn't know it yet Mm -hmm. until I was older. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things in the book that I related to on such a deep level, and I didn't really know why until later. But reading the book, I truly believe, got me through some really dark times in high school. Mm -hmm. And then I also just wanted to take, take a moment to point out that uh, yesterday I was on Facebook and a memory popped up from seven years ago. You know how it does that mm-hmm. thing? Julia, here's a memory <laughs> from seven years ago. Okay, let me read to you what the memory, so something I had posted seven years ago said. It said, I just learned that my favorite book, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, is finally becoming a movie. I remember writing a letter to the author, Stephen Shabosky, when I was in high school, asking if it would ever become one. He wrote back and said he was working on the script. That was, well, a long time ago. <laughs> so I really feel like that was yesterday right. when that, that memory popped up. So I feel like being here today is just one of those things where it's just meant to be. So I'm very excited. Absolutely. When uh, you emailed me about that yesterday, and I was thinking that is like the most crazy piece of destiny ever Mm -hmm. what a crazy random happenstance absolutely it's kind of creepy kind of creepy to be honest (laughs) no it's not creepy it's just Mm -hmm. it's just intriguing or something yeah i feel like it's a facebook creepy algorithm to no i don't know you know that facebook is just like stalking everything that i'm doing on my computer so (laughs) <laughs> and on your phone, if you have it on your phone. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'm just used to being stalked by Facebook by now, so it's fine. Mm-hmm. It's fine. So, Mandy, how come this is one you've never seen or read? Well, I didn't become aware of it as a book until after the movie came out. When the movie came out, I was really interested in it because it had Emma Watson in it. And I wanted to watch it, and then I just never did. Um, and I think... This sounds really bad, but I I usually am a person who will always want to read the book before I watch a movie. And in this case, I think because it was Emma Watson in the movie that I didn't want to do that. So once I realized that this was a thing, it's like, I'll read the book one day, maybe. But I really, really want to watch that movie. And then somehow I just never did. Like, I, (laughs) I don't know why it just kind of stayed floating in the ether for me. It just did. Yeah, okay. I know that that's not as fun as most of my answers on this. <laughs> I just didn't. I forgot. Yeah. It was like a, a bumblebee that distracted me. 
Yeah, I'm su- <laughs> honestly, I'm surprised I didn't know about the book. I mean, it came out when I was still in high school, and I was a voracious reader in high school. So I, I don't know why this didn't come across my radar, radar until more recently. I can remember the film coming out and the big conversation being, what is the tunnel song going to be? And then doing this mm. whole thing of what song they chosen. And, oh, it's David Bowie, so it's this classic. <laughs> but that's all mm. I remember about the release of it at the time. <laughs> all right. Yep. Uh, Well, before we jump into the conversation proper, I'm going to give a little bit of the history of both the book and the movie. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is a coming-of-age epistolary novel by Stephen Chbosky. It was first published in 1999 by the MTV Books imprint of Pocket Books, a subsidiary of Simon & Schuster. Chbosky ultimately wrote the book after he experienced a breakup, when he tried to answer the question of why good people let themselves get treated so badly. He was still in college when he began writing the novel in the summer of 1996, and he completed the first draft in just over two months. Two drafts later, the final version was completed in the summer of 1998. Chbosky pulled on his own memories and experiences to write the book. Charlie is loosely based on the author. Sam was based on girls who confided in him. And Patrick was, quote, all the kids I knew who were gay and finding their way to their own identity. Stephen always knew he wanted it to be adapted into a film. And on September 8, 2012, that film premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. Production company Mr. Mudd developed the film, hiring Chbosky to both adapt the screenplay and direct it. John Hughes had originally gotten the rights from Chbosky, but he never finished writing the screenplay. The film stars Logan Lerman, Emma Watson, and Ezra Miller. After the movie was announced, the book gained popularity and stayed in the New York Times top 10 list for more than 70 consecutive weeks. And if you haven't read it or you haven't seen the movie, I'm going to give you... Basically, the brief blurb from the back of the book, because I thought that worked better than anything else I could come up with. It follows observant wallflower Charlie as he charts a course through the strange world between adolescence and adulthood. First dates, family drama, and new friends. Sex, drugs, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Devastating loss, young love, and life on the fringes. Caught between trying to live his life and trying to run from it, Charlie must learn to navigate those wild and poignant roller coaster days known as growing up. So it's basically every coming-of-age novel ever. Mm-hmm. Slightly more mature, I think. We'll it, get into it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Julia, we do like to let everybody know how we watched it so that if it's available somewhere, folks can, can go get it that way. So I'm guessing that with as um, much as you love this, you probably own both the book and the DVD. Yes. I actually might be on my second or third copy of the book because I have let people borrow it Okay, without it getting returned, which I don't mind. So I often yeah, just perfect. rebuy yep. it. Yep. Yeah. And I've often given copies of the book to people. And uh, the the movie I actually owned on DVD and I've owned it for years. But this was my first time watching my DVD copy because I watched it in the theater when it first came out. And then I saw the DVD on sale one day, and I bought it, and I just put it on the shelf because I knew I wanted to own it, mm-hmm. but um, this was my first time watching it uh, again. So my second, what I should say is this was my second time watching the movie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matthew, what about you? Where is it available over in the UK? Uh, it was on Amazon Prime Video. I think it's just come off that and gone over to Sky Cinema because they've been doing a... Uh, LGBT sequence of films for Pride. Okay. So they've had sort of 20 or 30 films in a selection. Oh, that's great. Uh, and the book I found on eBay. Awesome. Because I couldn't find it in a library or a shop here. So hmm. interesting. Thank Inter- God for the internet. <laughs> um, I actually borrowed the book from a coworker because um, she had been talking about it for a while and I already had it in my possession uh, once we decided to do this because I had planned to read it at some point because she had been bugging me for so long so I, she just let me hold on to it because she knew we were going to record about it and then but this whole thing is just kismet isn't it it, it really is <laughs> <laughs> um and shockingly enough I also own the dvd I think I found it on like the five dollar sale chef uh sale shelf at like target and I've had it ever since and never watched it until mm. this week because I am horribly, horribly pop culturally deprived. 
It was meant to be. It was just everything was just meant to be yes, this week. It all That's fell all. into place this week. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, Mandy, what's, uh, do you have any experience of Stephen Jabosky from before this? When I saw this question got left in the outline, I was surprised because my assumption was this was his debut novel. He hasn't done anything else. He's a novel writer. Like, why would I have experience of this guy? And then I looked him up <laughs> and was completely shocked because he wrote the screenplay for Rent, which we both know is one of my all-time favorite movies. Yeah. Um, and we talked about it last year because you hadn't that, seen it. <laughs> yeah, that was basically why I left it in. I was like, okay, there's a connection here. <laughs> which is really funny because I know we would have mentioned it on the show and I just completely forgot that that happened. He also co-wrote the screenplay for the live-action Beauty and the Beast film from last year. And he directed the Julia Roberts movie Wonder, um, which I watched just a couple of months ago, and it was fantastic. So I've not seen anything that he's done that I didn't actually like, which is great. Hmm. Good. That's good. Yeah. Mm. Did you know that he had done any of that stuff, Julia? Only so reading your notes, I remembered that he had written the screenplay for Rent. I had kind of forgotten that, but... I I actually love that because <laughs> so top three things that literally saved my life uh, as an adolescent, the perks of being a wallflower, rent the show because the movie was not out mm-hmm. at that time, right. rent the show, and then uh, music by Radiohead. Okay. Literally my top three. Okay. So in some way, Stephen Chbosky is involved with two out of three. Unless he has some kind of relationship with the band Radiohead that I am not aware of. We should go look him up and see. Just because that would completely blow all of our minds if he did. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so during the course of this, he reads a number of books. Or he's told to read a number of books. Uh, Catcher in the Rye, Peter Pan, Great Gatsby, uh, The Fountainhead. Um, do you have any experience of that sort of similar material? Because a lot of those are required reading in high school, yes. So Catcher in the Rye and Great Gatsby, I did read in high school. Hamlet, I've read several different versions of it. I've seen it um, and just want to shout out that the best performance of Hamlet is Benedict Cumberbatch's version. Peter Pan, I've never actually read, but I used to watch the Mary Martin version obsessively on video. Um, Everything else, no. I've heard of them all, but never read them. And of course... They talked about the mash finale frequently in the book, Mm. which does make me cry every single time, which is interesting because I've never seen all of mash. I've seen I've seen it um, in syndication. So I've seen whatever episodes they've shown, you know, when they in syndication, they never show them in order. They're just like randomly shuffled. Um, But I have seen the finale. And even though I haven't seen all of the other episodes, I know enough about the characters that it does make me cry like a baby every time. Okay, so you could emote and understand some of the stuff he was talking about in each of these. Yes. Good. Right. (laughs) So, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, uh, and particularly talking on the book, did you enjoy it? I did. It's slightly complicated because I kind of needed to read the book and watch the movie to fully appreciate it. Um, My first impression of the book was, this is a modern day catcher in the rye which means it's really kind of pretentious and overly written a little bit (laughs) um but then i watched the movie and while the movie was not a great adaptation in my opinion which is a terrible thing to say since shabosky did both of them um there were certain things in the movie that helped me understand a little bit of what was going on better and and so i feel like smooshing bits and pieces of both of them together makes a better story than either of them alone. Like I, I think the, the, the sum of the parts is greater than actually the two things individually. If that makes sense at all. I, I think so, but can you color in some of the details? So what sort of parts came through better on the film for you or, or helped you understand the story better? Well, honestly, I think part of it is is I really needed to have read the book first because I remember the first really emotional bit that I got in the movie was in the first flashback of Aunt Helen. Mm. And if you haven't read the book, then it's completely innocuous, completely innocent. Mm -hmm. You're just watching him be really excited to see this family member. But knowing what we know about the reveal from the end of the book, it was a sucker punch to the heart. 
mm. right up front. And so in the movie, having already had that information, you get set up with that like really high emotional bar right from the onset of the movie. And so you're kind of riding that all the way through. And, you know, Patrick, the character of Patrick was brought to life more for me in the movie than he was in the book. Um, I can't say that about any of the other characters. And I know we're going to talk about casting a little bit later, but Ezra Miller just kind of blew it out of the park and making me see Patrick as more of a real character rather than just a f- kind of flat responding only to Charlie, which is kind of what I felt in the book. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird. <laughs> no, no, it's it's interesting to hear your experience of it because I, I found it interesting in the film um, that flash, the first time we see the flashback of his aunt mm-hmm. because the medium is so different in a film, you, you, Everything you show has to have a purpose. It's so rare that you show something that doesn't. Whereas in a book, you can have tangents and memories and, and references to things that, you know, Chekhov's flashback doesn't have to go off in the third chapter, third act of a book because you can pile in so much detail. Whereas on film, they showed that it's like, okay, that's going to be important. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the book, the sort of building of these memories and becoming more important, I, I enjoyed that more. I think it had a bit more nuance to it than... In the film, it's like, oh, there's a thing about his aunt. Okay. Right. I think the book, I think the the movie helped me appreciate the book more. And that's probably why I'm saying it the way that I'm saying it. Because mm. when I did finish the book, I I wasn't feeling like, oh my gosh, that's a great book. It's um, instrumental and, and pivotal and it's just amazing. But then I watched the movie and realized that the book filled in so many things that we didn't get in the movie but the movie was nice because you get to visualize more and and you do get to see some things you know the book is entirely from charlie's point of view and in Mm. the movie you get to see other points of view not just charlie's and so i think combining those two things together is what set it apart for me i actually that brings up a question that i was wondering and i don't know if any of Mm. us can answer it because did we all read the book before watching the movie yeah yeah because one thing i'm curious is people who have only seen the movie or saw the movie first there are a lot of things i'm wondering if they're even clear like i don't even know if the big twist with the with the ant or the reveal with the ant at the end is clear because it's expressed very what i like to call pg mm-hmm. in the movie mm-hmm. um so i was curious and I guess the three of us can't really answer this because we already know, but I would be curious to know if people who only saw the movie understood what actually happened. Uh, that's a really good point because I, I had made a note of that when I was watching the movie that it was, the reveal was very different. Like it, it wasn't actually a reveal at all. It was just kind of Charlie has a flashback and then he's in the hospital. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, and it, it was definitely... It didn't seem clear to me if I didn't already know. Yeah, I think this was written, or um, the movie was sort of made keeping in mind that with the idea that the audience would have already read the book. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we got um, one bit of feedback from uh, Dr. Kelly Jones on Twitter about the perks of being a wallflower. She said that she thought it was beautiful in its way, a dark, broken, haunting kind of beautiful, but it's too painful of a movie for me to watch more than once, and I barely got through it the first time, so I can't articulate any clear thoughts. Now, Mandy, at that point, I think you clarified that she's not read the book. Yes. So mm. I think from that it comes through, but it is just uh, dark rather than... It, it is a stunning revelation in the book that it just suddenly all comes out, and you, you the, the way he describes it, he goes through that sort of pit of despair and it all falls apart on him very, very quickly because mm-hmm. we're seeing so much more in the film. We see his sister's reaction to it. And like you say, Mandy, we don't get any of that because we're all in his point of view. We don't know that people are really caring about him. We just see that he is sinking at that point. Right. Mm. Right. And I think it's interesting to point out in the book too, the reveal actually is in the epilogue. Mm. Yeah. The book, the, the whole chapter where he talks about hey i've been in the hospital for two months this is what i learned about myself this is what the psychiatrist helped me find out that's technically the epilogue uh the epilogue obviously is part of the book but the chapter before the epilogue actually ends with him being like goodbye like like we think maybe he's gonna kill himself 
And then it's like the epilogue mm-hmm. that mm. where it's like, no, he didn't. He's in the hospital, and this is why he had the breakdown. So I think that's that's sort of an interesting thing that I don't know if I really remembered that until I finished rereading it this week and being like, oh, wow, yeah, that whole reveal, that's epilogue. That's like two months later. So it kind of gives it an interesting perspective on the structure of the book that way. Yeah, I, I don't think I had noticed that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's very rare to have such vital information in the in the epilogue in that way. But I think this comes back to the epistolary nature of it. That the fact that because we're reading his letters, in theory, you get that final letter uh-huh. of, of him sort of having the moment with Sam and saying goodbye and realizing everything, and then nothing for a couple of months. Like it, it would almost yeah. be good if you had a few blank pages, and then you come to the epilogue. Like, wait, what's going on? What's going on? Okay, now I get to find out. <laughs> Because you can imagine if this was real, if you had been receiving these letters from someone, you'd be like, wait, what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> what's going on, dude? <laughs> yeah, should I call 911? Yeah, exactly. Who, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, really interesting to deliver it in that way. Mm-hmm. And and I, I think the therapy, that, both before that and then after that, really stands out. Because as I was reading it, it had a slight sense of, oh, he realizes his trauma from his past and now he's okay. But actually... The fact that it is several months and the fact that it takes him time to get back to, in inverted commas, normalcy, you know, some sort of even keel, Mm -hmm. it really comes across that it's not just he realizes what the problem was and is okay. It takes a very long time. He really does struggle through it and they want to keep an eye on him because they know how serious it all is. Mm -hmm. It it treats it with the respect it should do. Um, And I'd imagine, Julia, that's one of the things that sort of uh, was good for you to see. It wasn't just, oh, you realize something and you're fine and you're now okay. Go out into society. That was a point that you brought up. I don't know if we're there yet, but since we're talking about it, yeah, no, the thing you had kind of mentioned, like, it seemed like that whole weird, like, the forced happy ending, hopeful ending. Mm -hmm. And for me, and I see, I see what you're talking about with the movie because you lose that time, but it's actually, the book for me is really kind of ends really depressing Mm -hmm. with hope. There is hope. Because he didn't kill himself. That's right. why there's hope. But it's actually quite depressing because he's he's barely starting his path toward healing and recovery. Because him learning about his past and why he is the way he is, is how the book ends. So he doesn't get to start living in the solution in the course of the book. We hope that if there were more that he would start healing and living in the solution. But also in the book, I can't, I, I know I just watched the movie, but I also watched all the deleted scenes. Mm. Okay. So I can't remember, definitely one of the deleted scenes, the alternate opening of the movie is Charlie in the hospital having a breakdown. So in the book, he's um like catatonic for two weeks. Mm. He's not responding to anyone. He has a full mental breakdown. Right. He doesn't talk, he can't see anyone, or he can't respond to anyone. And it, there's a deleted scene on the bonus features, which was the alternate opening of the movie, in mm. which it's kind of like Charlie is the camera. So you see like his mom and his sister looking at him and talking to him with, you know, with very sort of a scared, sad looks mm. of like, are you okay? Are you warm enough? Is everything okay? And I... I think they cut that completely from the movie. So you don't realize that he, yeah, he's, he was catatonic for two weeks and he's been in lockdown in a mental institution for two months. So you do miss that sort of, oh yeah, no, things, things were really bad before he has the reunion with Sam and they go through the tunnel one last time. Right. Yeah. I think, um, kind of what, what prompted me to, to start thinking about those sorts of things is... I mean, because the book ends at the end of his final letter in the epilogue where he's told his friend that what had happened and what he realized. Um, he does end it by talking about how tomorrow he's going to start his sophomore year of high school. Mm. And he's not afraid of going anymore, that he's not going to write any more letters because he's going to be too busy participating. And I just I feel like that sounds really, really good. Mm. But... He's essentially starting his sophomore year of high school the exact same way he started the book, his freshman year of high school. He doesn't know anybody. 
all of the people that he loved and he was friends with throughout the book, they all left and went to college. So he doesn't actually have any friends anymore. And we already know that he is prone to depression. We know that he's prone to be very introverted, to be a wallflower, so to speak. And so I'm wondering what's really different about how the book ends and how it begins. You know, mental illness doesn't magically go away. Just like you're talking about, he's he's had a very serious and severe breakdown. And, and so I'm not sure, and, and maybe this is just me being overly pessimistic, but I am not sure that this is really a happy ending that this is really something he's going to move forward with that, that he's different than he was before. I, I see what you're saying there. And, um, there are parts of that, that I agree with and that I disagree with. I think one, he definitely is different, even if, and I actually kind of love stories that do this, um, when they come full circle and, when people kind of end up exactly where they were in the beginning of the story. I love little little things like that. But ultimately, the journey that he went on the last year, it's impossible for him to not be a different person. Right. And I think one of the things, so that little bit at the end of the book where he's like hopeful that you talked about, mm-hmm. like, oh, sophomore year, I'm going to participate. To me, that's kind of like what I like to call the pink cloud. So he's had this terrible nervous breakdown. He gets out of the hospital. There's this thing, you know, this moment called the pink cloud where you're like, I'm going to turn my life around. Okay. You know, I went through that terrible thing and now life is good. And as someone who does have experience with depression, I can tell you I've experienced that pink cloud feeling. Mm -hmm. And yes, the depression will not go away. And ultimately you're going to crash again. But if you can remember that pink cloud feeling of healing, that's kind of what can help you get through it the next time. And I think the way that I saw the ending in the book, at least, is not that I'm healed, everything's cool. It was literally him getting out of a mental institution and being on that pink cloud. Right. And he's probably going to crash again. But I I do believe that even as an introvert, he's his sophomore year in high school, he's going to be a little more um, apt to maybe try and interact with people, you know, to find new friends because it worked once before. So hopefully it'll work again is the way that I would see him thinking about it. Okay. I can Um, see that. Yeah. Um, And and hearing you talk about the pink cloud reminded me of one of the lines in the book that it wasn't in the movie. The Gosh, the book did so well at talking about depression. And there Mm. was a line, I think, where he said – I feel happy and sad at the same time, and I didn't know that was possible. And, mm. and I think that's exactly what you're talking about there. There are so many things about the book that represent depression, I think, mm-hmm. in such an intricate, specifically accurate way. And I, I know, I think we had kind of listed to talk about some of that stuff later, but it was really just, it's him just kind of feeling like, I don't know why I feel this way. Mm-hmm. Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel... And he's always blaming himself. There's like a whole moment at the end where he's like, I really wish that God or someone or my mom or my sister, or someone would just tell me how to fix this. Right. And it's those sorts of lines that you don't get in the movie because you can't unless you want the whole movie to be a voiceover. So those things, those things are hard to express visually. Yes. I think really what's going on inside of a, a a mentally ill person's head is really maybe almost maybe impossible to express in a movie. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that I miss most that that didn't get translated into the movie, but I'm not offering a solution. I don't know how it could have been done. Right. It would I think it would take a lot of camera tricks and finding ways to let the viewer know that what you're seeing is not reality and that's just hard Mm. hard to do i've seen it done and and of course i can't give you an example right now but i know i've seen it done um once or twice but it's definitely definitely hard um i I had been wondering how they were gonna do this movie since the entire book is completely internal monologue essentially because i mean that's what letters Mm -hmm. are Mm -hmm. and they 
you know, he did the best that he could to adapt letters to a visual medium, I think. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the one thing that lacked in the movie that the one possible solution, but I don't know, I'm not a director. I don't know if it would have worked. But one of the things that Charlie talks a lot about in the book is how much he's uncontrollably crying and he doesn't know why. Mm. And honestly, in the movie, I think we see Charlie cry once at the breakdown, mm -hmm. at the at the big breakdown. And that's something that's very true to depression, where you can just be having a normal day talking with a friend and have sort of a moment with them and realize the ultimate sadness of the world and just start crying. And he does it a lot in the book, and it's very endearing and very sort of sadly honest. And we never see that in the movie I that would have been a lot to ask of the actor, but I think I think the role would have required it was just that sort of ultimate sadness that I personally did not feel with a lot of the movie. Although that feedback that you got that you read, I mean, other people obviously feel it. Mm -hmm. So it's there. It's just me personally. The movie doesn't make me cry. You know, the movie doesn't make me feel heavy or anything or different afterwards but the book does I think it did for me just because I had just come off of reading the book and so in my brain I could put them two together and experience mm -hmm. experience the same event kind of coming from two different directions and so it did feel heavy for me but I was I was listening to you talk about how you there it didn't seem to be showing Charlie's sadness and I I think what Chbosky did was he had to go in a different direction because unless he wanted Logan crying all of the time while he was trying to portray Charlie, he had to find a different way to kind of show us that he was existing in this state of depression. And I'm mm. honestly not sure that I picked up on it while I was watching it, at least not consciously. But um, I've been thinking about it while I was listening to you talk. And one of the things that I liked about Logan's casting is – the facial expressions that he had in the movie. He mm. was so wide-eyed and so innocent and so, I don't want to say happy, but he always had this like weird smile on his face the whole time. And that never changed. And so we, we were kind of watching him, I think, be very flat emotionally from maybe almost numb. Like he's observing and he's kind of trying to experience things the way that he thinks he's supposed to be and that's why you mm. get him looking almost happy but nobody looks mm -hmm. like that all the time ever but he did in this movie and so I'm wondering if that was an adaptive choice to try and show that something wasn't quite right because he couldn't do it the same way he did in the book um I I get that that could be a possibility and I think um one of the things that we missed Actually, I think it was in the movie, but it didn't have the same impact. Uh, you know how the teacher, Bill, invites Charlie to to dinner mm -hmm. or to his house? Mm. Um, in that moment, in the book, Bill expresses how special Charlie is. Mm -hmm. And he says it, to me, he says it in a way, I mean, the way he's taken this kid under, the wing, uh, under his wing. To me, I think Bill probably saw that off the bat that something wasn't quite right with Charlie, you know? Um, and exactly what you described, where it's like, it looks like this kid is trying to behave in the way that society has told him to behave, and it's not working, and I can see that it's not working. And I think that could be maybe what what um, they were going for in the movie, and sort of that sort of just, I'm just going through the motions, this is what kids in high school do, right? Mm-hmm. And you see that you see that a bit in the movie. There's a lot in the book where he makes he sa he makes responses to things that just makes everybody else crack up because they're like it's so brutally honest and weird. Nobody talks like that. Who is this kid? And we love him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we are starting to kind of spiral into this conversation <laughs> of what's different between the movie and the book, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? So. Um, let's, let's just pick up with that conversation. Cause I think it's inevitable that we're going to do that anyway, when we're talking about yeah. two different adaptations of, of the same material and for someone to have such a strong reaction as you do, I think you probably have a lot of opinions about 
what was missing and what was different. And I think starting with Bill, we were just talking about. Oh, right. The relationship that Bill and Charlie had in the book and the relationship that Charlie had with Mr. Anderson in the movie were just Mm. completely different. Like, the character did not seem to be the same to me. I mean, number one, he didn't give that familiarity to Charlie in the movie that he did in the book. And so right off the bat, you kind of get a distance from him. Even though it was very clear that he was, he cared for Charlie and he wanted better things for Charlie, he never kind of got on that friend level that he did in the book. He didn't invite Charlie to his house Mm -hmm. in the movie. Um, And I I can't recall if he had the conversation where he called him special. I think he might have. At the end, I think, maybe. But I think I missed it because I was just like, what, this is it? He's not, why why is this not the same? (laughs) It's kind of where my brain was. Um, And I think that did, it had far less impact in the movie than it did in the book to me. I think, yes. I'm guessing they just didn't have time. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> for, for me, that's the, the one thing that's left out that I actually appreciated because it, it felt slightly sinister in the book. Yes, he was mm. helping him and, and could see that he was a very capable child, but there was just something about, no, this is becoming a little improper I because I felt there was going to be some revelation or something. I was worried that might be it. So I I think taking that out and just going, yes, he appreciates how good Charlie is, but isn't taking it to anywhere that is a bit unusual. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I've, that's it. That's a really interesting point because I never got, I've never felt that vibe off of Bill, but I could see how your mind would go there, Mm -hmm. especially, especially with the way the book does go. Yeah. Because it makes all the references to Sam's been abused and these people have had issues and, the way the the thing about generations and people treating each other badly, um, it's yeah. like oh, this could go really strange. So, oh. but that's pretty much the only thing. Like there is a lot left out. That talk, talking about the demonstration of sadness, that's always tied into the quieter moments. And I think the problem with the adaptation is it's doing a lot of the big set pieces, the parties, the dances, the sharing of presents. But actually, it's the times when he's shopping for presents or he's doing mm. just sitting with someone that he starts crying or feeling that. And it is that uh, the the long running thing about how presents are important for him and finding the right present for someone is such a thing, clearly tied to his emotions and his past. And because we mm-hmm. lose that, we lose some of the import about his feelings of guilt, his feelings of whether it should have happened, what he wanted from his aunt and, and his caring for her or not caring for her. And it's a real shame that's gone because it's such a, a great through line all the way through about finding the present for his dad, finding all the different secret Santa presents, and, and the presents for everyone. I think they make one mention that he shouldn't have bought for everyone. Yeah. But other than that, it's it's just gone effectively in the film, which is a shame. Yeah. Yeah. I think I read I read an article like late last night um, that Stephen Trubosky said about what, you know, some of the reasons he had to cut. Actually, wait, here it is. It's still on my phone. Mm. Um, Cinema Blend... We'll get to this in a second, but we're talking about the sister and the abortion scene. Mm. He says at one point, you have to be very respectful of people's emotional limits. All I wanted to do was make a movie that had the same emotional release that the book does. So he expresses that he was concerned that there was just too much heavy stuff Mm -hmm. in the movie. And, um... Which is interesting to me because I didn't think there was enough heavy stuff. I also like really depressing things. So if I'm sobbing throughout an entire movie, I'm like, this is the best movie ever. (laughs) Right. Um, Because that's how I find my emotional release is through things like movies. But so the the sister abortion scene, it's a deleted scene. And I didn't know this until like Mm. a couple nights ago. I watched the DVD. So even the deleted scene, or scenes, actually, I don't think were um, done uh, thoroughly enough to have the same emotional impact in as in the book. They did shoot where the sister, who also I realized in the movie her name is Candace, in the book she has no name, right? I think. I think his... we got her. I think it was Candace, did but we? I think it was only in there like once. Like once? Okay. Um, so we see her like at school looking depressed and kind of 
Charlie trying to talk to her and she's like, just leave me alone. And then him following her and assuming she tells him what happened. We don't, there's no like dialogue. I think she just starts crying and he comforts her. And then we see them in the clinic, right? And then he goes to the car and he waits for her to come out. So there's a couple of things that, that are like such important moments for me in the book Mm -hmm. that didn't make it to the movie one is the relationship with the sister and that uh, that scene the abortion scene in the book is possibly one of my favorite scenes it's that moment where she comes out and she catches him chain smoking in the car and she's like what charlie you're smoking i'm gonna tell mom (laughs) and he's like no you're not she's like what what do you mean no i'm not he's like are you kidding me? No, you're not. And he just starts cracking up. And then they both start cracking up because they realize what this this secret that they now have, this ridiculous scenario that they're in. And yeah, neither of them are going to tell their parents what they are both doing. Mm-hmm. But the reason it was so impactful for me in the book is because in the book, they don't get along. The sister is very mean, mm-hmm. Charlie. She doesn't like him. She's kind of a bitch to him. And um, another thing that was lost is one of the reasons she's so mean to him is because Charlie is the one who told Bill that her boyfriend hit her, which then led to the parents forcing her to break up with him. Mm -hmm. So she's got a lot of resentment toward Charlie. And then in that moment, they have this bond, this just sibling bond where it's like, okay, maybe we don't really get along, but we have this secret. That's a really heavy secret that we'll take probably to the grave for one another. And it's just this beautiful bond that we don't get to see. We never really see Charlie have a relationship with someone where it's really bad in the beginning and then it turns really good. And I think the sister was the the prime uh, situation where that could have happened and it didn't. Yeah, I I definitely felt all of that missing in the movie, but the movie did something the book didn't do that I liked. And and I'm not sure it's an adequate substitute, um, but they did show that there was a bond when Charlie calls her randomly out of the blue and she instantly knows something's wrong and she Mm -hmm. instantly tells somebody, call 911 and send them to my house. Um, Because that, that moment... I feel like was the most impactful in the movie. That's the moment mm. where I actually saw depth of emotion and a, a relationship of two people who really do care for each other. And I, yeah. I appreciated that being included in the movie. And, and so we did at least get one scene that showed the two of them as having a bond, even though it wasn't earned, I guess. It was, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was taken for granted that because they're siblings, they should have it. And that's not the way they express it in the book. Yeah, I did like that moment as well, the phone call. Um, I did actually want to, uh, something that you said reminded me of one of the comments I got on Facebook. You had said that the movie kind of didn't put in all of those impactful punches that the book did. And um, uh, someone, Maggie Farrow, she said that she's going to come in and be the negative Nancy because everybody (laughs) always, you know, just screams about this book. And she said, I read it several years ago and really didn't care for it. How does this one high school kid go through every traumatic event possible in the span of a single year? And not only that, but these are all pretty serious issues that are almost thrown into the story flippantly, not really gone into with much depth as if he had a checklist of holy shit moments. It was all a bit melodramatic for me. I'd say I wasn't the target audience, but plenty of adults I know love this book. Maybe if I read it in high school, I would have gotten more out of it. Or maybe if I didn't have a cold, dead heart. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I agree that um, reading in high school is a specific specific thing. Yeah, I I think so. That could be true. Um, it, 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 It is a lot happening to a single person but I think experiencing that level of depression as a 15 year old is going to feel like that regardless of whether it actually is like that or not it's going to feel like you are experiencing every single possible bad thing that can happen to a person and I Mm -hmm. think that was expressed very well in the book 
also, if you think about in a lot of instances, at least in, in my experience with people I know, it, people who are, for example, not emotionally healthy and maybe have, are experiencing or have recently experienced a tragedy, in a lot of ways, they sort of breed more tragedy. Perhaps they're they're not handling or mm. healing from one specific moment, and it leads to, I mean, for example, it's the whole relationship. I mean, we'll get to the whole we accept the love we think we deserve quote, because that needs to be talked about in depth. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, we are who we hang with. So people who are used to hanging around with unhealthy people are going to continue surrounding themselves with unhealthy people because that's what they know and that's what they think they deserve. So then you're surrounded by multiple people who are going through maybe heavier, darker things than uh, perhaps the average population. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't throw me. Like, I, I get what she's saying, but it didn't throw me. My suspension of disbelief was not affected with that because I know enough people who it's like, uh, here they go again. They just lost their job. Okay, now they're going through a divorce. Oh, now they're losing their kids. Oh, now they're drinking too much. Oh, now they're depressed. Like, it just, it's a cycle. It's a mm. spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's um, kind of two reactions. Exactly that same thing that it's all building on the first event, which it does open with the thing that his friend has uh, killed himself. And that's sort of because he's not sure how to deal with that. But it is all about him being a wallflower. So some of the events aren't even his, but he's seeing Sam's abuse from the past and things that have affected his family. But that's meaning a lot to him because he's trying to deal with his own mental turmoil and the issues he's going through. But I think it also comes across well, and this is one of the ways it reminded me so much of Catcher in the Rye, in that this is a very nice upper middle class affluent mm. area of white people. No one seems to have a job. Everyone has a car. Everyone has money. Mm -hmm. Um, so they are creating this melodrama because they feel their life has to have drama and has to have excitement or things going on. But actually, it's actually it's okay. Things can be all right, guys. But but everything is cranked up to eleven because there was nothing else to to do in their life but overthink everything. And and yeah. Catcher in the Rye has a lot of the very same thing. This guy is doing very well in a very nice neighborhood, so he goes around and starts inventing things in his head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's such a key example of sort of a mental health issue or depression specifically is that it, that's the that's the thing is like life could be great mm. like from an out from a persp outside perspective you have everything you need you have the job you have the family you have the career and then and that's something that charlie expressed i think so well in the book is like i feel like shit and i don't know why mm. somebody please fix me um and that's one of the things that's hard hard to understand about depression um, if you haven't experienced it is like that's the most frustrating thing is I know my life is good why do I want to kill myself right now mm. it's baffling and frustrating you know mm -hmm. so I think what you said exactly yeah that's 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 the thing mm. is it there's no you know it, the outside things don't really don't really matter they could be good or bad you're still going to feel feel like this in a lot of ways and, and i think uh, maggie's point I, I can completely see where she's coming from it does seem like a lot um it, it depends on your own experiences and the people you've known and seen yeah, yeah. I, so, so i didn't read this in high school i read this a few weeks ago on honeymoon so com oh, wow. <laughs> com completely the wrong experience for it. it you know on a nice sunbed by a beach by a pool but it gripped me and i, I must have spent eight hours just getting through it just could not put it down and read it and read it and read it. And then the next day, like, I needed to talk to someone. So just gave it to my wife, like, go away and read this. And then come back and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I finished reading it the other day. And, and then I watched the movie the next night. And as soon as I was done, I, you know, I can't really talk about this stuff online because that's going to spoil our conversation. You know, uh -huh. I can't tell people if I liked it or not. And I, I did tweet that I needed to talk to somebody or at the very least I needed to hear how other people felt about it because I just didn't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> so I've been looking forward to this conversation for a little while. Good. Good. Yeah. I like hearing that. <laughs> um, I do want to just quickly point out the, the two other things. Okay. And it, 
I feel a little guilty um, kind of critiquing the movie because I do know that Stephen Chbosky wrote and directed it. So it's it was done the way he wanted to, hopefully for the most part. You know, I'm sure that there were some limits based on whoever was paying for the movie and the producers. But the other thing, uh, I missed all the smoking. This mm-hmm. was set in 1991 and 92. Smoking was not taboo. Mm. And... I think that that was a huge external symbol of how Charlie was kind of going down the rabbit hole. And I could relate to that because I started smoking in high school as well. So there was that. And then the poem. Can we talk about the poem slash suicide note for a second that didn't make Mm -hmm. it into the movie? It was a deleted scene, and I didn't realize that. Yep, there's a deleted scene of him reading it. But again, him reading it, it just doesn't have the effect. Because what are you going to do? You, you, you show him reading it, and you show the people sitting around him have a reaction. As opposed to, for me personally, I'm reading that poem in the book. I'm imagining the person who wrote the poem, you know, growing up and putting things on the fridge and then becoming an adolescent and realizing that life isn't as good and then killing himself, you know. So that has a, a huge effect. But that poem, I used to read just that poem over and over again uh, as a teenager to kind of get through tough times because I related to it so much. Yeah, I wanted to know what your guys' thoughts on that poem was. It was heavy, Mm. for sure. And I I definitely agree it was missing from the movie because it was, like the smoking, it was another um, symptom of, of his kind of falling in love with this poem that's kind of expressing the feelings that he's having that he doesn't understand Mm. and he's trying to share it with the people that he cares about and say hey this is a thing that I found and I don't really understand it maybe you'll understand it for me and we don't get any of that and I Mm -hmm. think that definitely does change some of the dynamics of how we see Charlie in the book versus how we see him in the movie. But again, it's one of those things like, really, how would you have done it in the movie? Right. It's it's just one of those things. There are things that are meant for different mediums. Um, The thing, not just the poem itself, but also in the book, there's a moment, I think, where they're at a party. And I want to say Charlie hears um, Sam and Craig having sex. Yes. And um, he says, I think I'm I think I finally understand the ending of that poem. You know, Mm -hmm. you miss that that is really kind of the impact that you get a few chapters later. You're thrown with the your this poem is thrown at you and you're like, oh, that's heavy. And then a couple I don't know how far later in the book, all of a sudden Charlie's like, oh, I get it. And you're like, oh, oh, that's real heavy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, let's actually talk about Charlie and Sam for a minute. Yeah. Um, The Charlie and Sam that we got in the book are not the same Charlie and Sam that we got in the movie. For Mm -hmm. sure. I think the transition that we got in the book of Sam taking Charlie under her wing and like being friends with him and wanting to help him, recognizing that he has this crush on her up front and telling him, this is not a thing that you should do. You should not like me like that. Mm -hmm. That was very important for how that relationship developed and for how we got to where we got to at the end. And by not having that scene in the movie, it changed the entire thing. Because from the viewer's perspective in the movie, all we saw was Charlie's crush on Sam just getting bigger and bigger and bigger with no discouragement at all. Mm. And so when that scene happens at the end where she still says, well, why didn't you ever ask me out? One, it doesn't make sense. And it. I, I don't know. It just it changes that whole dynamic because you feel like instead of having her be this platonic friend who genuinely just wants to help him, you get her being up on this pedestal the entire mm-hmm. time with Charlie never being discouraged and never understanding that she's not somebody he should think about like that. And it also changes the whole scene with um, him and Mary Elizabeth. Like it's, it just, it changed the impact of so many smaller storylines by not having that one line up front or am I just Mm. overthinking it? No, I, no, I, I see that. And I feel like I read some other comments online about other people feeling similar to that. 
I think in the movie, I think you're right. I think I didn't think about it that much because there were things um, with the whole character of Sam, maybe both Charlie and Sam in the movie that as individual characters that were not how I envisioned them Mm -hmm. in the book. So already, like I was thrown. So already just, I don't know if we want to go into casting right now, but again, obviously Steven Chbosky got the cast that he wanted. He was so happy for this. You can see him, there's like a featurette of him talking about how his cast is perfect. So in that sense, because he says so, the cast is perfect. For Mm -hmm. me, I, I think both, Charlie and Sam, for me, were miscast. And by miscast, I just mean they weren't how I envisioned those characters at reading the book. And the big thing for Sam, as much as I love Emma Watson, and I think she did a fantastic job with the role, to me, she just wasn't right. Because in my head, as a fan of the book, to me, Sam was was an F up. I don't know if I can mm-hmm. swear. She was messed up. She was, you know, she had the history of being a slut. She was, she's a drug, they're all drug addicts, alcoholics. She's edgy. She's a rebel. She's Mm -hmm. a punk. Mm -hmm. She's dark. She's not, you know, Emma Watson is cute and put together and smart and classy to me. Mm -hmm. Also, it doesn't help that she's Hermione. (laughs) Right. And British. And that's another thing is like, you know, she did a great job, but the, the accent was in and out. So you feel this very proper upper class girl. And even if she is upper class, I still feel like in my mind, she was she was meant to be a punk edgy like I don't even know what the word is. That alternative girl in the 90s who everybody was like, oh, yeah, that that girl, she's so cool. And yet she's she's a bitch, you know, that same. And that's just not who Emma Watson is. And it doesn't matter how good of an actor you are if if that's not you that's not you yeah so uh my immediate thought was that the casting for mary elizabeth and sam was backwards yes oh yeah (laughs) yes because um i pictured mary elizabeth throughout the whole thing even though i know she did the punk rocky and and she did all of that stuff i pictured her as very wholesome and very God, I hate to say uptight, but that's kind of the impression I got reading about her. Yeah. And yeah. and so I I honestly I pictured her as like blonde and so like kind of more like how Alice was in the movie. But I did picture Sam as having more of that punk look, and that's exactly what they gave mm. Mary Elizabeth with Mae Whitman doing that casting. So it just it did feel a little bit backwards to me. So I think that that kind of got in the way. For me. Yeah. Well, and I think you you also mentioned this in in your notes is one of the things that made it harder to believe was we didn't get a sense of the age difference between Charlie and Sam or between Charlie and any of the other group in the cast because, Mm -hmm. you know, he's supposed to be a freshman boy and they're all getting ready to go to college and Mm -hmm. they look the same age in the movie. Mm -hmm. Also... In the book, Charlie, not only is he just a freshman, he's a he's a late bloomer freshman. He's small. Mm-hmm. They talk about how small he is. So he's one of those kids that actually looks 15 and not one of those kids that's Hollywood right. 21 playing 15. <laughs> yeah. But that's hard. You can't get, you know, there's a lot of restrictions with making a movie and working mm. with underage people. Mm. And I agree what you said. Logan Lerman, his face, his face was perfect. Yeah. His body too built, and here's the thing that threw me the most: his voice was too low. If you just close your eyes and listen to his voice, he sounds like a thirty year old man, oh, and okay. that's what threw me. That's what threw me from the opening of the movie. I remember this when I watched it in the theater, and when I watched it again this week, I'm like, "That's not Charlie's voice. Okay. He's just hitting puberty. He's a late bloomer. Yeah, he can't have this deep, manly voice." So that that threw me. And I just want to, you know, reiterate, everybody did a fantastic job. It's just not how I pictured people. Oh, but I do have to admit, when I first saw the movie in the theaters, I did have sort of a bias because, and I have to admit, I couldn't find the article again. I didn't look very hard. <laughs> but when when the movie 
came out in theaters, whatever, six, seven years ago, when I was reading about it, I read an interview with Logan Lerman on how he was preparing for the role. And he expressed something along the lines of, and I can't, you can't quote me on this because I couldn't find the article, but I remember him saying something about watching sad movies and eating alone in a restaurant. And as a person who has struggled with depression throughout my life, I was like, what? I took it personally. I'm like, that's what you think depression is? Mm -hmm. That's how you get got into the the role? Mm. And I still think he did a fantastic job, but I was, I, I had that bias going in. And I was like, well, this, this actor doesn't understand depression, so he's not going to get this. Right. So yeah. that kind of also ruined it for me when I first went in watching it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that he's sad. He is troubled. There are things going on there. Mm-hmm. And, and it, you made me think something I wanted to ask you. So uh, when we got back, I lent the book to my mum as soon as possible because I knew this was one that she'd like as well. Mm-hmm. She utterly threw out Red Charlie as being autistic, which mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. I wondered about in the beginning and then I wasn't sure. But her experience as a head and children that she's known over the years, she's like, no, there is so much in here that is pointing to that and, and things like the the way he follows rules so precisely, the way he describes doing math. Mm-hmm. Do, do you both read it that way? Do you have any considerations on whether he's autistic or not? I didn't want to say that because I don't know if it's true. Mm. But since we've brought it up, yes. But only not when I read this as a teenager because as a teenager, I had, to be honest, I don't think I had ever heard of autism or, mm. or the spectrum. Right. So as an adult reading this again this past week, That moment that we talked about where Bill says, you're special, I think that's what he means. I think that's why Bill saw Charlie and immediately took him under his wing. Because I think that he saw that maybe Charlie was on the spectrum and he needed that that extra help. But it's never never said in the book. I've never seen a reference um, that that is actually the case. I I did wonder in that scene specifically if, if... If that was what was being alluded to, but there, I mean, it's definitely not explicit in the book at all, yeah. and it's not in the movie version at mm, all. No. Mm-mm. Okay, I just. Although that. there was a moment, I think was it you, Mandy, that made a comment about the scene in the movie where um, Charlie's at the dance and he just kind of randomly approaches Sam and Patrick. <laughs> yeah, that was in my my when I was taking notes about the movie um, because I I don't buy for a second that would happen. Right, you said that, and the only reason, I actually love that moment in the movie, because it cracks me up, because the look on his face and his ridiculous dance moves are just so ridiculous, <laughs> but that's that leans on the whole idea that maybe he's on the spectrum, is he's like, oh, I'm supposed to just go dance into the middle of the dance floor, because that's what people do, right? Hmm. Okay. So th- yeah, in that that sense, I can... I, I can definitely see. Okay. That. Yeah, no, that's definitely a different perspective. Um, I mm-hmm. think I was projecting myself in that scene a little bit oh, yeah. because I would <laughs> never, ever, I would have been sitting there so upset waiting for somebody to approach me. You know, I, I would need them to come ask me to dance with them rather than me joining them. <laughs> and yep. that's the, that's all I was thinking about in that scene. Yeah. All right. Well, we have been talking a lot about things that we don't necessarily think are great. Um, well, specifically with the movie, I think we all really enjoyed the book. Um, but, but let's move into what some of our favorite moments were, um, both from the book and from the movie. Matthew, did, did you want to go first on this one? Oh, I feel like I'm going to steal it if I, if I mention Patrick's actor. So do you guys want to take it? Oh, no, Cause, you do cause, it. Because Ezra Miller. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we have to talk about yeah. him. I mean, Patrick is yeah. a great character anyway. Because uh, he has his own troubles, his own story going on. There could be a book about Patrick and what he goes through, and it would be fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and even just his introduction with, with everyone calling him nothing. It, it's mm-hmm. funny. You can see that how prickly he is and, and also how sharp he is in general. And Ezra Miller is just a, a good enough actor to pull that across. Oh, every single aspect of it. He is wonderful. I agree. Yeah. Commence it's gushing. So... <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so interesting to me because the, f- okay, so the first thing I ever saw Ezra Miller in was Fantastic Beasts. Never seen him in anything else. And he's very, huh. very dark and very broody. Uh-huh. And I was just not sure what I thought about this Ezra Miller dude because I hated the character he was playing. 
But then I saw him in Justice League and fell utterly in love with him as Barry Allen in The Flash. And so then I saw this, which again is a third completely different genre of film, completely different character, completely different personality that he's portraying. And he just nailed it. He nailed all three. And so like kind of ruminating on that, I'm just thinking Ezra Miller is like one of the greatest actors of all time. He can pull off anything. He's fantastic. And just not having like realized that, especially when the only thing you've ever seen him do is Fantastic Beast. You know, that character is very broody, very robotic almost. And and so to see that contrasted with Patrick and the exuberance and the flamboyancy that he has as Patrick, just, it's amazing. I think the first thing I ever saw Ezra Miller in was... Uh, I am 90% sure the movie was called City Island. It was a little indie comedy. I want to say he ha- couldn't have been... I almost want to say he was like 12 in that, but he was probably older, maybe 15. He plays this um, kid in this dysfunctional New York family who has a fetish for overweight women. And so he goes online, you know, interacting with women like cam girls who are overweight. It's like this ridiculous comedy, but he, he steals the movie. And then, if you haven't seen it, we need to talk about Kevin. Yeah, so that's what he came to this off the back of. So if we're talking okay. yeah, difficult I mean, roles. Mm. Yeah, I'll just warn you, it's a tough movie and you, you won't want to watch it again. It's probably one of the hardest movies I've ever watched. But he, again, just just you know, just nails it. It's, it's pretty intense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty great. Mm. Yeah. I thought he was I thought he was cast perfectly as Patrick. I do wish that he was given a little more time, screen time. Um especially with um you know, I, I don't remember if we talked about kind of how Charlie and Patrick's relationship changed cuz it went in a very dark direction mm-hmm. in the book mm-hmm. where Charlie's basically letting Patrick kind of use him. Um, as a rebound in a sense and there's a moment in the movie where Patrick finally breaks down after everything that's gone on and I think we lost that because I literally in the movie he's about to break down and then he like falls into Charlie's arms and then they cut like he he I don't think he was given the screen time to do that scene Mm. and I think he could have nailed it it's just they literally just had him fall into his arms and then cut, you know. And I was like, I want to see Ezra Miller fucking lose his shit right now because I know he can, and I know it would be beautiful. But yeah, but I, I'm wondering if he just wasn't given the opportunity. Yeah, I think time had a lot to do with some of the the cuts that we yeah. felt in the movie, just because yeah. you could not do this book line for line in two hours. Mm-mm. I mean, because it, it spans so much time, like a year, almost a year and a half, I think, when you count the, the summer mm-hmm. following his, his freshman mm-hmm. year. So time. We just need time. Yep. It just needed to be a series on Netflix, <laughs> a limited series, like one season. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, isn't that what everyone's doing these days? It does seem to be so. It would work. It would absolutely work. Um, oh, it would absolutely work. But I, I just love Patrick's story. It's so... Uh, it, it's evocative the way it comes through because he's such a larger-than-life character. I love the uh, the juxtaposition between the way Brad deals with his feelings towards Patrick and then the way Patrick deals with them after they break up or are forced to break up. Just mm-hmm. that the, that's what they both go to to mm. deal with their discomfort and their societal pressures. and It's so well done. I'd love to. I'd love more time for hear that in the book or another book. Or <laughs> yeah, you guys are making me want to go reread the book. <laughs> <laughs> so That's where I am. What about you guys? Favorite things? Well, I had three lines, um, or I guess more than lines, but but three quotes from the book that really, really stood out to me, mm. um, and that I related to super well. One of them was charlie went to see a movie i don't even remember what movie it was i think it was the subtitled movie with mary elizabeth maybe 
Mm-hmm. And he said, the movie itself was very interesting, but I didn't think it was very good because I didn't really feel different when it was over. Mm. And when I read that line, all I could think of was, wow, Charlie has incredible insight for a 15-year-old. Because I didn't, like, realize that that's a thing until – probably till we started talking about movies and podcasts. Like, recognizing that the mark of a good movie is that there's change. Mm. And – so for him to be able to articulate that as a 15 year old, it just really stood out to me and I, I liked it. And it also made me think, wow, I've never been able to articulate that as clearly as Charlie just did right then. Mm -hmm. Um, Later he also said, it's strange because sometimes I read a book and I think I am the people in the book. Mm -hmm. And I have experienced that so many times in my whole entire life. But, but, but I've, again, it's, it's something I've never seen articulated so clearly. Stephen Jabosky is pretty great with words. Mm-hmm. And, and then the last one was just kind of Charlie describing his depression, but I think he doesn't know that, that it is depression. He, has, he can't label it. Um, and he said, I don't know if you've ever felt like that, that you wanted to sleep for a thousand years or just not exist or mm. just not be aware that you do exist or something like that. I think wanting that is very morbid, but I want it when I get like this. That's why I'm trying not to think. I just want it all to stop spinning. And that, again, is just like a sucker punch to the gut because I, I have expressed that to people before. I have I have told people I am not suicidal, but I don't want to be here. I don't want to exist on this planet right now. Um, and I just want everything that I feel to stop. And it you just don't often see depression written like that. You you see depression written as general sadness, general lethargy. You don't really see the numbness and the intense <sighs> despite the numbness, there's still an intense feeling of wrongness that you experience and I think Chabosky nailed it when he wrote those things. And I think a big part of that is and he says, you know, it's I think he says in general about the book that it's deeply personal, but not autobiographical. Mm-hmm. But I think, I mean, I, I don't want to make any assumptions, but some of those words. Yeah. I mean, you have to you have to understand depression, I think, to articulate it that way. Yeah. And, and that's I think that's the number one thing that has always spoken to me about that book is exactly what you're saying is like Charlie articulates these things that I do or I feel or I think, and I didn't realize that other people felt them. Right. And um, in a sense, it was kind of, I know as a kid, it helped me feel less alone. I'm like, oh, this, whoever wrote this book understands how I feel. So I'm not, I I guess I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one. Somebody else feels this way too. And I think that's really the core of why that why the book was has such had such a big impact on me over the years. Yeah, that's completely understandable. All right, well let's open the floodgates, Julia. What <laughs> go ahead and gush, <laughs> like just, you know, let us have it. What are your all time favorite scenes in the book? Okay, so book, let's see. Um uh the quote, we accept the love we think we deserve. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many times I have requoted that to people in everyday life that in the book it's a direct response to charlie telling bill about his sister getting hit in the movie it was watered down a little bit where it kind of seemed like it it was referring to people in general both his sister and sam and maybe some other women um himself but that's just that's just so profound i don't even know if i need to talk about it i just (laughs) i just think it's so so profound it's so true Mm -hmm. so the uh the, and in that moment, I swear we were infin- infinite. Mm-hmm. That's probably the most iconic line from the book. And um, wasn't in the movie at all. It so what what made it to the movie? So what happens in the book is when they listen to that song. That in the book he doesn't tell us what song it was because it it wouldn't have the same effect, which I think is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um. In the book, they're sitting listening to the song. The song ends and Charlie says, I feel infinite. Now, the quote, and in that moment, I swear we were infinite, was not a piece of dialogue in the book. He says it later. Mm-hmm. He, at the end of the chapter, like he's like, he describes uh, the rest of the night or whatever. Right. 
and and refers to it again. So, I mean, in the movie, it probably would have had to be voiceover. I I know some people hate voiceover. Mm-hmm. I like it. It doesn't bother me. I think it could have been used more. But um, the that whole scene with the song and feeling infinite, like, I get that. I actually have a specific memory in life in high school where I was sitting not in the bed of a pickup truck, but in, in like the cab part in the back um, with high school friends. And um, the song Let Down by Radiohead came on, and it was the first time I had ever heard that song. And I had the exact same experience that Charlie was talking about hearing that song Mm -hmm. and just being like, what is this? Oh my God. And then you're just silent. And then the song ends and you're like, what just happened to me? I just had an experience. So that was a huge, that has just always been such a huge thing for me. Um, My production company is called Infinite Pictures, you know, and that is directly, directly related to this book. And also just how I do believe that the universe is infinite and that we're all connected. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of what gets me through the hard times in life. It's like, nope, everything happens for a reason. It's fine. We're all connected. You know, I have to keep trucking because if I don't, it could affect somebody else negatively. You know, if you ever think, for me, if if I've ever had, you know, like suicidal ideations, it's like, nope, it would hurt people. Nope, I'm going to... I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Mm-hmm. And um, it's kind of like what you said earlier, Mandy, where it's just like I've had those moments where, you know, I don't say that I want to kill myself anymore because I've done a lot of work through my life to get through that. But sometimes I'll be like, I want to go to sleep and never wake up. Is that cool? Right. <laughs> is everyone cool with that? Yeah. Um, so that moment is just huge for me. I do want to acknowledge that in the movie – I mean, what were you going to do there? Like, everybody, what's that song going to be? What's that song mm. going to be? Of course, my th- my thing <laughs> for... And I, and I actually wonder if that's the real song that Stephen Chbosky... If that was a true experience in his life, if which I believe it was, if that was the song, or if he had to pick something else um, for whatever reason. I have a hard time believing that these alternative punk goth kids in the 90s who love the Rocky Horror Picture Show don't know who David Bowie is yeah. or don't aren't familiar with his work or the, his sound. They would have recognized his voice. So that's, that's what I didn't believe about that section in the movie. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, did, did either of you reading the book, did you have a song in your head that you were like, oh, for me, that's this is the song. Uh, keep in mind, I have a, po- a podcast called Pop Culturally Deprived. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> because yeah. yeah, I don't know any. I you know I'm, I'm gonna like embarrass myself here. One, I didn't recognize that that song was a David Bowie song in the movie. Two, I couldn't name a single David Bowie song when he died. So mm-hmm. that's the level of pop culturally deprived we're talking about here. Like. I did listen to the Beatles. I no, I no. I'm. It's so terrible. I was so sheltered. I I knew nothing about anything. Do you ever do music versions of this show, or have you ever thought about it? Or maybe next after you get through all your movies, <laughs> uh, we haven't. People have asked about it in the past. Mm, we've talked about um, it. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it's, there are just so many movies though that I, I think eventually we will kind of start winding down on the movie stuff because we're gonna get into like the stuff nobody's seen nobody else Um, has seen either yeah i mean there's only so Um, many movies so so. yeah (laughs) so so maybe one day although i i am trying to to expand my music education as well um but yeah that's why I i cannot recall a time where i was that affected by a song immediately um i i'm sure i have been because music is very important to me in my life but it it grew to be more so after I was of the age where I would have had this sort of epiphany experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think I didn't, yeah, I didn't picture anything whilst reading it. 
But talking about that sort of moment, a song just absolutely standing out out to you. I can remember driving to university to pick up my results at the end of the degree and Bush's Glycerin came on the radio. And for oh. whatever reason, that is a song that just stays with me as this is a song of momentous import. <laughs> and it's not. Mm. It, and that's perhaps what they should have pitched for in the film. Not necessarily picking, you know, one of the great songs or one of the great artists, just something random that happens to come on. Yeah. I think that would have been, uh, I don't want to say safer, but safer is yeah, actually yeah. trying to find a song true to the era, 91, 92, from a really obscure indie band that most of us wouldn't have heard of. Mm. Yeah. But, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> but speaking of the music, that's like my other, there's um there's a mixtape that Charlie makes for Patrick in the book for mm-hmm. Secret Santa. Back in the days of Napster, I made myself that mixtape. Um, with those songs you know you could find all those songs for free thank you napster sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry all the musicians that got screwed from that um yeah i remember making that mixtape and listening to it a lot of those songs actually they don't they're not really my favorite it is a very like kind of like a soothing slash depressing mix so a lot of those songs have a huge effect on me because of the book and not necessarily because of the song, which right. is interesting. Hmm. Music was far less important in the movie than it was in the book, I felt yeah. like. Yeah. I'm wondering, too, while well, they had the Smiths asleep, because that was obviously obviously his favorite song, but also it's like, how expensive would it have been to get all the rights to all those songs? Right. <laughs> Probably It would have been crazy. <laughs> yeah. It would have been crazy. I. I'm guessing they just couldn't afford it, and then they did decided not to really replace it with other things. The poem I already talked about. Yeah. Uh, and you know what's interesting about that poem, though, is reading the book this time around, I was like, oh, really? That was the poem? Because it did not have the same effect on me oh. mm-hmm. reading now in my 30s. And I think a big part of it is I don't really struggle with my depression anymore. I've done a lot of work to... um kind of take care of that right so i don't relate to it in the same way i remember just reading the poem and being like oh that was it it's done oh okay yeah that was the poem Mm -hmm. um but i still remember how much that poem affected me as a teenager and in my early 20s and that's that's kind of like all that matters i'm still going to speak very highly of it and actually we should acknowledge what does it say in the book it says dr earl Room, I didn't look up how to pronounce this. R E U M is the author of that poem. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and I, I love I think what what you were saying earlier about how because he's in a dark place he goes towards dark things. And this is something that you can just see him it, it's almost self destructive thinking this is one of the great poems. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think I think uh Oh, we talked about the relationship with Sam and Patrick and just how that whole idea of just how Charlie thinks the way to love someone is is by letting them kiss you. You know, you see mm-hmm. those little that foreshadowing of what his the root of his issue is throughout the book. And you see that with um Patrick where he's like uh, th- I think there's literally a line uh, it's Patrick kisses him and then Charlie says and I just let him because that's what friends are for mm-hmm. that's his understanding of friendship you mm-hmm. know and it's just so it's uh, it's just I get it like I get it and it's sad I uh, there's this other quote that jumped out at me specifically last night as I was finishing the book mm-hmm. that I didn't remember and it says I think that if I ever have kids and they are upset I won't tell them that people are starving in China or anything like that because it wouldn't change the fact that they were upset. And I think that's one of those, another just such a a great way of writing about depression, Mm -hmm. which is just, it doesn't matter. Like, I know, I know other people have it worse. And it's almost worse as somebody, when you start to feel guilty about your depression, like, ah, other people have it worse. At least I'm not on the street. I have three meals a day. It almost spiral. I I think it very easily makes it worse. Mm. Um, well, it does because it invalidates the feelings that you're having, mm-hmm. and and those feelings mm-hmm. are perfectly valid. You feel what you feel when you feel them. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, I think, Mandy, this was in your notes at some point, or, or maybe, Matthew, it was yours. It was um, something about Sam, the, the weirdness in the movie about her being kissed by her dad's friend. Did oh, yeah, that was me that? in my notes, because I didn't remember them talking about that in the book, but they probably did in the beginning, because I wasn't super invested in the book at the beginning. Like, it took a little yeah. bit before I got into it, and so I, I probably just didn't remember it. I actually had to go back and find it, because okay. I was like, I know she talks about it, but I couldn't remember. I saw your note, and I was like, I had to go back and find it. It's really, like in the movie, it's really glossed over, Okay, um, which I think is kind of the point. Because Sam is like, she tells him like, oh, the first time she ever got kissed, she was seven and it was one of her dad's friends. Oh. End of story. That's all you need to know. We get it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's just interesting to realize how sort of people of who have experienced certain things are attracted to one another. They find each other. Mm-hmm. And also the point he made at one point in the book where he's like, you know, you might If two sons grow up with an alcoholic dad, you know, one of them will never touch alcohol and the other will become a drinker. Mm -hmm. It's like that sort of thing. I think that's hit on a lot in the book in terms of of the child abuse and just how, um, you know, hopefully I think there's a little hint where Charlie in the end where he's realized what he's gone through. He's like, oh, I'm I hope I'm going to make a point to turn into the, the person who doesn't do it. You know, mm-hmm. who doesn't follow in the footsteps of my aunt and her dad and whoever did it to him, you know, or right. whoever mm-hmm. it was. Uh, I think that's I, there's just so much. I mean, I could sit here and just like talk about specifics about the book, which, you know, six hours later, what are we doing? <laughs> but um, I think overall it's just. It's just like it's just this deep, deep emotion that is expressed articulately that a lot of us can't express in that way in writing and to have somebody who's done it for us and that we can experience it through reading their work is just such a gift it's just such such a gift and it for me it just it's had such a huge effect on my life in just keeping me sane and knowing knowing that I'm not alone um and I, I can't speak highly enough of it. That's all. That's all. I better stop now. No, I think it's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad that you suggested this um, instead of the movies that, that I had suggested to you. Um, so I'm really glad that I've experienced this now. Yeah, I think we can see just how good it is. The fact that all of us at some point have read this and then just wanted to share with other people. We want to talk about mm-hmm. it. We want to dig into it. There's There's so much to it. Um, like mm-hmm. those quotes that you had, Mandy. It's it, because you come away thinking about it and the revelation at the end and all the different characters because they're so well put together, because it is this watching of them. It's not necessarily partaking, the participating, but you sort of get a, an idea about their lives, but you don't quite get all of it. So you want to dig in and see what other people thought. Mm-hmm. It's so well done, the whole thing. All right. Well, is there anything else that we need to discuss about the perks of being a wallflower? I want to read you that letter. Tell yes. me when it's... No, absolutely. Did I do that now? Absolutely. Okay, so a little backstory. Did I say it already on the recording? But <laughs> A little backstory. So this book affected me so much that when I was a teenager, I wrote a letter to the author, Stephen Chbosky, and I specifically asked him, because I was also just getting into like the idea of screenwriting at that time, and I specifically asked him if I could have his permission <laughs> to adapt his book into a screenplay. So imagine this, like, 16-year-old girl writing a letter to this author and being like, hey, is it okay if I adapt your book? (laughs) Um, So he wrote me back, and I actually keep this letter framed on my desk because when I'm working, sometimes I look at it to inspire me. So I'm just going to read it right now. So it's January 28th, 2003. Dear Julia... I have to apologize for how long it has taken me to write back to you. Truth be told, I do not live at 220 Grant Avenue in Pittsburgh, so it took a lot longer for your letter to find me. On top of that, I have been extremely engrossed in writing over the past year. But I didn't want too much time to slip by without thanking you for your kind words about the perks of being a wallflower. 
It really does mean a lot to me that you loved the book so much. In terms of a screenplay based on the book, I am indeed planning to write one later this year. I would have gotten to it sooner, but sometimes I need a little distance to see something so personal to me in a different way. If I'm happy with the script, I'll direct the movie. If I'm not happy with it, I guess it'll remain a book forever. All I know is that I won't sell it to Hollywood because it would kill me if they turned my book into a typical teen movie. I hope this letter finds you well, Julia. Thanks again for writing, and best of luck to you with your own screenplay writing. Considering how lovely you seem in your letter, I think your movies would be very special. <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realize how, how much that moved me. That's the part that I read to myself yeah. when I need to. Sincerely, Stephen Trubosky. And um, I just want to point out that it looks like this letter was written on a typewriter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and it, just reading the letter you can just hear charlie and him you just know it's it's just him yeah so as i keep that on my desk what a good guy i know yeah, yeah i would absolutely keep that framed on my desk if if that were me as well so yeah. i i think it's i think it's wonderful that he took the time to write you back specifically yeah and it's not a form letter it's very specific to you and that is amazing. Yeah. And that was, fortunately, I, I, I'm guessing he maybe doesn't have the time to do that anymore. Maybe he still does. You know, that was yeah. 2003. So the book was quite famous, I think, already, but it wasn't a movie yet. So mm -hmm. yeah. it had a smaller audience. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Well, if you would like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. Or you can also email us at podcast at eloquentgushing.com. And you can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy Kay. And I'm at Matthew Vose. Julia, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. And particularly thank you for being so open and prepared to share with us. Um, I always say that the, the best episodes the ones that we really enjoy are where people come and talk about what something means to them and, and seeing just how much this means to you it's been wonderful so thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for having me um where are people able to find you and your work um in general everywhere i'm at julia morizawa right now i'm specifically actually when this episode comes out i think i'll be at the tail end of a crowdfunding campaign for a project that I'm producing along with Brigham Snow, who plays Caleb in the Bright Sessions. Mm. Uh, the project is called Pure, and you can find it at www.journeytotheannex.com. So check it out when you can. We'll use all the support we can get. Oh, yeah, I'm super excited about this. <laughs> we will make yeah. sure we link to it in the show notes as well. So if I can go and find oh, it thank there. You. Yeah. Good, good luck with it. And again, thank you. It's been a wonderful show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Pop Culture Deprived is 100% funded by listeners like you through our Patreon page. Anything you give gives access to exclusive content like outtakes, behind the scenes uh, information, and early access to some episodes. And it helps to support the network and develop new shows. To find out more, visit patreon.com slash eloquentgushing. And don't forget to visit our homepage to subscribe to the weekly newsletter and keep up to date with the latest news and announcements. The link is eloquentgushing.com. We'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we'll talk about Much Ado About Nothing with Kim from the Service Desk podcast. Until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And we didn't talk about anything heavy or light. We were just there together. And that was enough. Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, please visit eloquentgushing.com.